So Future City is a movement of communities connected to the fireware uh, community. And what we do is public and private uh, 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 bringing together. And so we get partner science. Um, and um, next slide. And um, uh, the, the questions, <clears throat> the question we're focusing at is how cities, villages, and regions are changing. And we focus on the processes do, uh, in that transition. Um, we're also working on a, on a city deal, which we uh, introduced yesterday with 40 partners. So you see them here and, and more heading up, uh, organized by the Ministry of the Interior together with the city network G40. And we focus on the question, uh, what kind of tooling do we need to, to, to make the um, smart city to the new normal? And then the line will post the link to the, um, to the city deal in the chat. And uh, heading up for today, flying to New York um, uh, with Alexander Shermanson. And um, you can find his QR code here. So if you want to connect him, please scan this code so you can find him on LinkedIn. And during his presentation, Alexander will ask you to fill in some questions at, um, at the Mentimeter. And um, if you scan this QR code, please, or go to menti.com and fill in this code which we will also put in the chat box and uh, you can remake an interactive uh, afternoon. So uh, last but not least, uh, we can also connect and, and this is my QR code. So a lot of QR codes uh, today, that's because of uh, the, the quick presentation I gave you. Uh, heading over to Alexander for this, for the rest of the afternoon, the important part. Alexander, very welcome uh, in, on this mission, and it's up to you. Hi, uh, hey everyone. Great to Great see to you. See. Great to hear you. Yeah, uh, we hear you too. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so, uh, so thank you, yeah, William and uh, Wendeline, for organizing this. I think it's totally amazing how you're traveling the world doing this. And uh, I very much enjoyed being in the audience in previous sessions. I also need to, the, the reason I think why I'm here is thanks to uh, Jakobin Deswan at RVO. So thank you, Jakobin. And also uh, Jordan Splinter at the Dutch Consulate in New York, uh, who um, has, organizes the missions that are in person and has been uh, one of the organizers behind this. So thank you, Jordan, for being a great partner on this. Uh, I'm going to share a few slides with you all. I'm going to pop out, do a little surveying, a few more slides. and aim to, to keep it all till no more than 10 to 15 minutes. Uh, and um, so there I it is. screen up now. So hopefully you're seeing that. Uh, unfortunately, when I'm presenting, I can no longer see you. So I'm going to hopefully see, uh, imagine you all nodding along uh, happily. Uh, so just to give you a sense about myself, uh, I, I live on Wall Street. That's my daughter with Fearless Girl staring down at the New York Stock Exchange, which is literally outside our door. Uh, my first uh, innovation project was with the Field Museum of Natural History, trying to develop, we developed a gallery guide for handheld computers. If anyone here remembers the Palm Pilot from more than 20 years ago, that's what we used. My first government innovation smart cities project was a tech strategy for the Chicago public schools. This is back when we thought it was a big audacious goal to connect to the internet. Just imagine us now, right? Uh, I have worked on innovation technology uh, and data projects with cities around the country from New York to San Francisco with some of the biggest uh, companies in this space from Salesforce and Xerox and others. And I've done extensive work with both New York City and New York State. And uh, my background is as a classicist. So you can see there's uh, Plato and his definition of statesmanship. It's a little small, it's a joke. What he's saying is that political leaders are kind of like pig herders. So pig herders and political leaders, we go together. 
Uh, so just a, a quick snapshot of the smart city timeline in New York. Uh, back in the 1970s, the city was facing fiscal distress. Uh, uh, and there was, uh, at the time, the, the city council required the mayor to start issuing a management report. And this was, even then, hundreds of metrics telling you about the operations of the city. And so this has become uh, an annual tradition right, with the mayors telling the city how we're doing. And it's, uh, the, I think, one of the most comprehensive data sets you see uh, for cities anywhere in the country longitudinally. Uh, it got a really big, it was really just an annual reporting exercise until the 1990s when Comstat was introduced at the police department where the data then became used for weekly management meetings. Uh, and that has been credited with reducing the violent crime in New York by more than 90%. That is, uh, in when Comstat was introduced, there were 2,000 murders in the city. Now there are about 200 murders. Uh, and it's the safest large city in the country. The smart city timeline became a little bit more inclusive uh, in the early 2000s with the introduction of 311. And all of a sudden, we can call in and tell the city what we're thinking, ask questions, make complaints, request services. And this became, uh, I think, more so that, than uh, elsewhere in the country, a great way to measure resident, uh, resident views and resident interests. A step further in the late, about 2009, was Big Apps, which is the I believe the first city-sponsored data competition, looking at ways to use city data for public purposes uh, with outsiders coming in the ideas. And then just a few years back, we launched the Neighborhood Innovation Labs. And this is taking the idea of the competition a step further. And instead of uh, any outsider coming with an idea, it's people working on problems that they face themselves in their neighborhood and how can the city and the entrepreneurial community support that? Uh, and so I'm gonna come back to that theme in a minute of people uh, solving the, our own problems and being our own innovators. Uh, but I would love to just pause for a minute and get your thoughts on competitions, city competitions. Here's a, a code for menti.com. This is the first of three questions. I'd like to survey you on. We'll have the others later in the presentation. I'll leave the code up once more and then switch to start putting the results up. Okay, so we're gonna toggle to the results now. Aha, so I see some results coming in. Uh, uh, Wendeline put the link in the chat already. If you're having trouble finding it, you can look in the chat. What I'm seeing here, oh, uh, uh, good. So, so the interest in the competitions is growing, but there's still quite a few people who feel that it's not really their cup of tea. Uh, you, what we've seen in New York and uh, in other cities around the US is there was a, a great interest in the competition approach over the last 10 years, but what we found is that a lot of times it was hard to scale external ideas inside government. And the ideas didn't actually reflect the needs of the people who were going to be using the technology. So it was often people unfamiliar with the city or unfamiliar with the public policy or the community coming up with ideas. And so now we're in a mode of saying, how do we use the benefits of competition, which is wonderful new ideas, lots of new interests, crowdsourcing, and find a way to make it a little bit more inclusive so that the ideas can come from inside communities themselves and then be deployed inside communities. And what we find here is that when we do it this way, there is a greater likelihood that ideas will stick and scale. So, uh, I want to dive now into uh, prop tech. That's real estate and construction and property technology. And uh, I, I think this is a great opportunity for more inclusive innovation here. You can see 
uh, it has been a booming sector uh, with the, the VC investment in it last year, almost tripling what it was the year before and almost five times what it was just two years ago. Uh, these are things from smart elevators to energy efficient building management systems to uh, generative design uh, for the architecture process to a host of other services. And uh, New York has leaned in very heavily in this. Uh, why? Well, as uh, the author of Catch-22 said, real New Yorkers talk real estate. We care about this all the time. And, uh, and I think uh, if uh, our former mayor is right, New York is a city where the future comes to rehearse, then you will be seeing these technologies more and more prevalent in other cities around the country. But, but the deployment of it is extremely uneven. You can see Hudson Yards, a brand new neighborhood with some of the smartest buildings in the city uh, and great uh, energy efficiency within them amenities and so on. On the other hand, the low income housing, which uh, is lacking billions of dollars in just basic maintenance, let alone smart building opportunity. So why is that? So, so one of the reasons why we're not seeing the innovation in the below market housing is because people solve the problems they know personally. And venture capitalists and founders generally are not coming from low income backgrounds. They're coming from business schools and they're coming from other places of privilege. And so they're solving different problems. And just as a, a point there, most of them are men and most of the money goes to men. Only 11% of the deals are go to women. So there's an example of how people stick within their network. Secondly, the digital divide is deeply holding back affordable housing residents. This is something that we've grappled with a long time, the unequal access to the digital economy. But at this point, uh, for low-income Americans, a quarter of them are smartphone-only internet users. That means that the richness of the experience or the, the complexity uh, of the applications that might be needed for homework or developing your resume or other things are just simply not available to them. And then the industry itself is uh, relies heavily on established models and relationships. And just as a little uh, point here, one developer, one of the larger developers, one of the most innovative ones in the country is trying to lean into technologies around this. And the best pitch that they've received thus far is for a robot lawnmower. Like, really, is a robot lawnmower the, the answer to affordable housing in this country? Uh, I think we can do better than that. Uh, so I want to pause for a sec and hear your thoughts uh, on this next question, on question number two. So this is the same code up again. Hopefully you still have the link and we can take a look at the results coming through. So have you deployed smart cities technology specifically for low income residents? Uh, I see some of the yeses growing. That's looking nice. And so, but still, the, the no's are overwhelming. And I think this has been the case that we've seen across the board. And uh, as I've engaged in, the, in more inclusive innovation in some of our lower income communities, the needs are not the same. Because of the uh, different education levels, because of the different pressures around childcare and, and jobs, it's simply not the same thing as having like a smart, um, a thermostat in your home. We need a different approach. Uh, so a little bit of what that approach can look like is when we think about affordable housing, a lot of the energy that's going into innovation is around the cost of construction. And secondly, around the, the operations of the buildings. Uh, there's also a, a fair, quite a bit around uh, reducing barriers to ownership. And these are all very important pieces of it. But what's lacking are the wraparound services that we know are so important for building sustainable, resilient families. And so by these wraparound services, what I'm talking about, Harris, I'm going to skip, I'll come back to the survey a sec. One, uh, 
some of these wraparound services are like financial resilience. So we have a much lower banking relationship among people living in affordable housing. And as a result, they have less access to savings. Uh, if there are, you can gamify savings as some startups are doing, can create community savings clubs. The access to fresh fruit, food is lower in our lower income communities. As AI enables uh, different grocery models with smaller footprints and uh, shorter supply chains, there's a potential for micro stores in each food desert so that th there's more access to food in low income communities. Healthcare. Generally, the chronic disease correlates very heavily with, uh, with low income, and yet access to health services is lower. Telehealth would be an option if there were the, uh, the broadband and the connectivity to do so, which could reduce hospitalizations. And from a work perspective, job training, of course, uh, we have personalized training through Coursera and Khan Academy and others at a high skill level. But when we think about some of the low and mid-skilled jobs that are uh, more available for people in affordable housing, we don't yet have personalized that and the, the career path that can lead to some flex work there. And by creating a vertical integration across these services, we can begin to create the wraparound services, designing these services with the people who use them, as opposed to imposing them from, from Silicon Valley or from elsewhere. Uh, just before I close, this is a huge market. Half of the US is rent burdened, and that was even before COVID. And that's typical in a lot of global cities or around the world, very high levels of rent burden, meaning a disproportionate amount of your income is going to, to your household costs. In the US alone, we are investing 10 billion a year in below market housing in the tax credits. That's it. And in addition, there's a host of private and local government investment there. We're creating almost 100, we're creating 80,000 new units each year. And what's interesting is these are for-profit developers doing it with very significant portfolios, 10, 20, 50,000 units. So this is a tremendous op market to innovate into. So if we looked ahead on this, uh, seeing more innovations that could, uh, fit into the vertically integrated wraparound services I was describing. Uh, I, I'm working with some large developers here in the US. I'm beginning to test these and deploy them. So I'd love to hear ideas that you see from other industries and other countries. As we move past COVID, uh, we're seeing massive shift in what uh, the private sector looks like in terms of delivery, in terms of remote, and there are, new winners coming out of this, that we're also gonna create new inclusion opportunities to think about how uh, the lower income of society can benefit from the, these new post COVID uh, innovations. And third, as we look for systems change, we're looking for global partners who also will have a patient view with us getting towards the changes, creating some inclusive change together. So with that, I am going to stop sharing. And open for questions. Thank, thank you so much, uh, Alexander, for, for giving this perspective on uh, uh, smart cities. And um, we um, have a small tradition, which you already know, and that's, that's that is that we have somebody for the first question. And today that's uh, Chiet uh, Hakao. Chiet, can I ask you to ask the first question to uh, Alexander? Yeah, sure, you can. Uh, uh, well, thanks for your presentation, Alexander. Chiet, uh, Chiet um, you have some, have Chiet, you have some problems with the- uh, doesn't matter, and we work with- Chiet, hello. With the internet? Yeah. <laughs> you have some problems with your Wi-Fi, I guess. Can you, can you hear me? Uh, I'll just walk down, see if it works better from there. So we see your whole house now, or? <laughs> yeah, large house. Are, am I, can you hear me now? Yeah, it's much better, sir. So. OK, 
Okay, I'll try it from here. Well, as I was saying, <clears throat> Um, I have a spatial design office called Space and Matter. Uh, we work a lot with uh, bottom-up um, projects uh, uh, based on, on the kind of community um, demand. Uh, we built in uh, Amsterdam Nord a, uh, a uh, actually community-driven floating neighborhood of 46 households with a lot of new technology in it, not because we want to push technology in, but because the, the community actually wanted the community. And I always have the feeling that that with all the, the technology, there's such a big push without there actually being a real big question of people. Um, myself, I live in Amsterdam also in a, com in a kind of community self-built uh, street with, um, and, and we, we share a lot of stuff, which makes it a very great community to live in, but we only have one uh, app for that, which is WhatsApp. And it's what with uh, with which we share food, which which we share cars, with uh, how we help each other out with kids, and it's it's really you know the the community itself that needs to be kind of smart instead of the technology being that smart. Um, I, I hear Alexander talk about the 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 prop uh, tech, prop tech. Um, uh, well, I don't want to call it hype, but the the prop prop tech developments. Um, but it's, it is really about the, the hardware there and uh, about the buildings and how the buildings function. And I'm, I'm wondering if you could also um, uh, share a little bit with us, uh, with us how you think about like more the software solution. So the technology that actually motivates people to live in another way and to be able to help each other out, uh, which makes their life uh, uh, okay. better. So, um, Alexander, the, the soft prop tech solutions. Can you tell us something about that? Uh, yeah, I, I think it's a great question. And I, th I think I'm going to answer it um, uh, two ways. Uh, but one, I just as an aside, I, th I think it's fascinating that WhatsApp is generally only used in New York in circles with European exposure. So uh, whenever I have groups of friends and, and one of them is European, then we use WhatsApp. But if everyone was born in the US, then we don't. And Asia, you know, it might be cacao talk or something else. <laughs> Interesting cultural differences there. You know, on the uh, on the prop tech software side, uh, you know, th th there are, I think, a host of uh, early stage and promising uh, software around the building operation itself and the interaction between the building management and the tenants whether these are uh, uh, ways to manage uh, electric demand so that you understand better uh, if you run your washing machine during the day, it's going to cost you this much in electricity versus running at night would be that much. Uh, uh, around, th there's some very interesting ideas around digital closets that, that are just being piloted. So a digital closet is uh, basically a micro warehouse in your building for all your stuff. And so instead of you putting the uh, Christmas tree decorations in your closet and leaving them there, taking up space that you could use for three, you know, most of the year, the digital closet logs it and stores it somewhere deep in the basement and serves it back up to you just at the moment you need it. So then it creates much more usable space uh, around the building. Uh, there's uh, what, I, what I was trying to get at with the presentation, I think, is an opportunity we're not addressing yet around services and prop tech. So from uh, a below market perspective, we have great evidence around uh, the factors that create more sustainable, resilient households. Right. All right. So can can you can you give us some more? Um, you, you gave some 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 more facts on, on, on that market. But can can you give us some more facts on how big that market is, and in the meantime, in in the same time, how uh, how you can influence the lives uh, of the people living in the let's say right picture of the left picture of that yeah. specific slide. Right. So, uh, so we're we're talking here about, uh, um, uh, you know, somewhere around a third of the U.S. population. And is it is it? Do you think it will get 
bigger uh, after COVID. Uh, how big do you think this market will be? Uh, this, this is not a nice question, I know, but it is growing, isn't it? Uh, it is growing. Uh, it's that there, we have a lot of questions right now, or what, what's happening around mortgage assistance and rent assistance. And so that, that's going to play into it very significantly. Uh, there's a, a bit of a vicious circle in, in how thus far the mortgage assistance programs have done, which is postponed the reckoning for a few months, but haven't really done anything to, to solve the problem. Uh, but um, this is, it, it is a growing market and there is increased need for uh, financial resilience. Right. And so part of the challenge is with uh, lower financial literacy, people not really understanding how savings work uh, with lower levels of banking relationships. People don't have access to different savings tools. Uh, it creates a, a greater level of precariousness. There's a, a famous stat in this country, which is half of Americans, if faced with a $400 emergency, would not be able to pay for it. $400, half of Americans, right? Uh, and uh, it, so what happens if your car breaks and that's your way to get to work and you can't afford that $400 repair, you're not gonna be getting to work. So th there have been a host of new uh, startups that are trying to solve this problem. So this is really this is really a win-win, isn't it? It is. So I think one of the ones I'm most excited about is, is a company Lifesaver. And what they've done is they've gamified uh, savings oriented around people with low income. And so it, uh, if you participate in the savings plan that you set up yourself, it could be, I want to save $100 between now and Christmas so I can buy my kids gifts, right? And if I hit that, then I get entered in the lottery to win another $100, right? And that $100 is actually going to come from a community bank. And so now I'm going to have an introduction to a bank that has my interests at heart. And so, so this is kind yeah. of a lot of nudging in, is it? Can, can you give us some more of these, these examples um, um, uh, of, the, of the products and services you, uh, you work with? Yeah, so uh, you know, another area, access to health services. And so it's a, a lot of our uh, um, below market uh, affordable housing communities are seniors, right? And so it's it's a confluence of of poverty, age, and with that you have chronic disease, right? And uh, not being able to get to the doctor for checkups exacerbates the chronic diseases, whether that's diabetes, obesity, high blood pressure, which then is going to lead to hospitalization or potentially leading to not even be able to live by yourself, you'll need supportive living. And so there are, uh, another company has worked with insurance providers to provide on-demand, non-emergency healthcare, uh, uh, health travel. So this is, is not an ambulance, it's not emergency. It's kind of like Uber or Lyft, but for old people getting to the doctor, right? And uh, so I think that that's an interesting way to, to work, the uh, find a business model that's a different approach to a service that, that's been proven. So, so, so one more question for me, and then we, we head to the questions in the, in the chat box. What I'm wondering is why, um, why is this, this not the normal way to do? Because what you, what you um, share with us are uh, solutions for, for a huge problem in the, in the US. And so, just, they're, they're easily available. That's what you're saying. Well, so, so I, I think this goes back to the, the people uh, solving problems and with the, the resources to solve problems don't often know what these problems are or don't really understand them. And the people who understand the problem don't have the resources to come up with innovative solutions. And I think that's where inclusive smart cities comes in, is bridging that gap. So, so that, that, that's that's not about smart. That's more about the city part, in in a matter of fact. More about how the society is divided. I mean, it is about. It's also um, uh, as we think about 
uh, deploying the new technologies around um, like building uh, building energy management systems, right? There's a, mm -hmm. there's a whole host of great stuff. And in the picture that I showed you on the right, th these are some of the most advanced building management information systems, I think, anywhere in the world to, to really hone, the, to make sure they're not wasting a, a single watt. Uh, one of the reasons why those systems don't work as well in uh, in affordable housing, at least in the U.S., is often the tenants don't pay their own utility bills. It's a system. Right. So, so there's a lack of incentive to deploy it, right? Okay. So the demand management uh, uh, technologies depend a, a bit on actually caring about your demand. Okay. And so, uh -huh. So that there's so some mismatches between the market that we need to solve in order to get these to work. So, so this is also an online mission and also a, 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 a interest for for companies. For what kind of companies is there a market um, in in this uh, area? And who do you need to solve the problem? Um, so I, I think there's a there's a growing market in it, and it's going to be picking up. Uh, in the coming months, thinking about uh, how do we use uh, innovative solutions to the affordable housing challenge, uh, where there are either construction or building management solutions that work in denser uh, cities, right? So not single family solutions, but multifamily building solutions. Uh, I, I think there's interest in viewing those and seeing how those might be adapted for this market because they, the path to market is probably a little different. Okay. So construction and building management. Secondly, to the extent that there are uh, approaches for connecting people to financial services, health services, and mid-skill, low-skill workforce training, those are really compelling. Okay, thank you. The, uh, to the chat box, uh, Jan Roest uh, asked us, uh, what is the impact of the turning down of the new uh, Amazon HQ uh, on on your uh, presentation, on, yes. on your story? Uh, so I, it's a, 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 great, a great example there of uh, how do we think about inclusion and not. Uh, so the background to the Amazon headquarters is that the city of New York, as well as uh, community groups and uh, um, uh, a number of private universities and uh, private investors, spent close to ten years investing in the um, technical op the technological opportunity for Western Queens. This is the area where the Amazon headquarters was slated to go, right? And so that investment looked like uh, a neighborhood technology plan. Uh, it looked like free broadband for people in social housing. It looked like uh, a new campus, technology campus for a university. And so this was at least a decade of planning there. Uh, in the wake of the canceling Amazon HQ2, Amazon is still growing jobs in New York, but those jobs now are growing in Hudson Yards, which is that gleaming neighborhood I showed you. So the rich neighborhood is getting the jobs and wealthier, and the area that had been primed for more inclusive growth is not happening. Okay. And so I think what's ha what we will see is uh, as it grows, we'll see a continuing widening of the gap as a result of it. So it's getting bigger. Yeah. Um, a very practical question. Are you sharing the presentation? I guess so, or in, in one form or another, and we will send an after mail to, uh, to the participants with that info, and it will be at our website. Another question, um, some discussion and some advice for Chiat uh, about an app. And then in discussion, a uh, question, how far could this smart city technology specifically stimulate welfare and go away beyond res responding to specific circumstances in affordable housing? So more or less, what is the next 
the next level and not not regarding to problems but making the world really a better place yes so uh i think one of the uh, hopeful things that's coming out of this pandemic is uh the shift to remote work for a host of lower skill jobs so there's people who work in call centers a number of administrative clerical jobs that six months ago neither management nor labor would have considered a work work from home opportunity has become a work from home opportunity mm -hmm. however like we we all. the job skill training from home to help people get into those jobs and even if they do get into the jobs they don't have the technology at home to, to access them so uh so i, I think a, a smart workforce strategy that that focused on uh, remote training for flex work jobs that were lower skilled has a huge opportunity here. I think there's a lot of interest, not just from the affordable housing sector, but from many different players in that. Uh, and we see a blueprint for how that can work from how a lot of the, the higher skilled job training works right now, whether it's for lawyers or data scientists or others. Uh, and uh, we just, because previously there was not a clear market there, we didn't, uh, I think we haven't invested in that innovation. Okay. I think this has opened up a much bigger market. Okay. And another question is, should building owners, uh, asset managers prov uh, provide the technology from data, like sensor, like sensors, uh, to affect the well-being of tenants? What do you think? Uh, so, so there's a host of privacy concerns, and I'm sure as uh, many of you saw, Sidewalk Labs uh, is no longer developing Keyside in Toronto. Yeah, there are a lot of reasons for for that uh, uh, to mention, or uh, they, or will, or, or which are mentioned. Um, so, so uh, there, 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 and so part of it was that there was a lot of pushback around data and privacy that created concerns there. Uh, ironically, a lot of the uh, tracking that Sidewalk was proposing is already fairly commonplace in, in other buildings and public spaces, whether that's pedestrian counts on the sidewalk or, uh, or, or in buildings um, and elsewhere. Uh, that I think one of the positive things that Sidewalk has developed is uh, public data planning process that starts to make some of these tricky questions available for community and engagement yeah and so as we think about building owners doing this if they learn some of the strategies that sidewalk has done around showing what data you're collecting why you're collecting it and who it's being shared with uh, there, there's good evidence to believe that people will be more amenable to sharing those data uh, and uh, and where they aren't, the, the building can adjust accordingly. But is that about privacy, or is that also about autonomy and 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 the society? Uh, I mean, it's. Uh, I think a lot of it has been driven by privacy concerns. Okay. Okay. Uh, you know, there's a lot of interesting work on uh, independent living as we look at aging uh, and independent living and the role of IoT potentially to help uh, people live without um, in-house help for an, a, a couple extra years, whether it's monitoring near falls so that, so that people understand their loss of balance, whether it's monitoring uh, blood sugar levels or other aspects remotely that can help then uh, target preventative work. There's been a, a lot of great energy around that. It's it hasn't been deployed at scale yet in the U.S. I think it's it's getting deployed better in some more autocratic countries, but I think there's a, some promise there as well. Okay, thank you. Before we go on with the other questions, um, I see people heading off, and that's because it's uh, uh, four uh, four four uh, o'clock here in in uh, Europe. And uh, I want to say cheers to you, um, uh, and then uh, yeah, we do that also with a nice glass of beer. Um, and uh, uh, thank you very much for this <coughs> for this interesting presentation. And uh, the people who are still with us, 
thank you so much for for being with us and uh, next week there is another thing flying away and the week after uh, we fly to uh, China so uh, uh, and that's in the morning because of the time difference um, going to another question there's a lot of interesting work going on in the UK somebody mentions but it's more a mention so learn from that um is there an open data platform in new york city where companies can tap into uh yes and uh brian posted a link to it uh open data dot city of new york uh, so that's that's this question is answered there huh? yeah um new york has one of the largest open data portals yeah of a city and continues to publish there do you, do you also you use that for for an uh, for one other purpose? Uh, I, so it's um, it, it's used for a whole, whole host of different purposes. Uh, it's used well, in fact, for some app for some services for insurance providers to understand risk in different areas and underwrite premiums. So there's insurance companies working on it that way. Uh, it's used from uh, transportation planning. Uh, mm -hmm. and there's a host, uh, a lot of different transportation data that's put there, both by, and it's used by advocates as researchers, as well as industry for managing that. Uh, there's great uh, um, real estate layers there that are used by people that developers and others for uh, planning new development and understanding zoning more effectively. Okay. Uh, yep. it's so, that, so, so it's a very, very good thing. Um, uh, Hans, uh, Hans asks us if this smart development is a way to tackle the institutional and even political barriers related to people with low incomes, poor housing. Um, well, yes, it is, right? I, I'm not sure I quite... Uh, so, uh, so is smart development a way to tackle institutional barriers? Uh, uh, yeah, 